thank you, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> I feel you have um, pretty well said everything I was going to say, so I may as well go and sit down and we can keep the show on schedule. But, uh, no, Brian, thank you. Um, and I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be here today at this much anticipated and much postponed seminar. At serious risk of becoming typecast, I'm taking my inspiration once again from the reign of Henry VIII. And loyal Hortonistas may recall that my previous talks also focused on various aspects of life at the court of this wayward monarch. When Brian kindly invited me yet again to join the roster today, we spoke briefly about the 17th and 18th centuries, but I said I didn't think I'd be able to offer anything that hadn't essentially been said before. Not so, however, if we turn instead to the royal bedroom of Henry VIII, and quite a lot of interesting material had ended up on the cutting room floor when I was preparing my, my book on Goldsmith's work at uh, Henry's court, hence the curious uh, title of my talk. So this is a nice chance to sweep up some of those things and explore what a multi-purposed space the Tudor royal bedroom was. I'd like to address two things in this talk. First, what the king's bedchamber looked like and what it contained. And secondly, the range of things that went on there, apart from, that is, sleeping and, uh, shall we say, dynastic protocols. The, um, the first of these turned out to be a great deal more difficult than the second, because unfortunately, we don't really know. Henry VIII, like God, had many mansions, and Simon Thurley's fascinating book, Houses of Power, pieces together the floor plans of several of his residences, uh, or manors, as they were known. These included Whitehall Palace, Hampton Court, Greenwich, and Nonsuch. What he proposes is partly speculative because very little of these houses survives. But as far as Whitehall is concerned, we can deduce something from the sequence of rooms from the great inventory of Henry's possessions compiled after his death in 1547. Thurley thinks the, uh, the privy chamber area of the palace must have looked something like this. With a kind of hierarchy of privacy as one moved from the outer, more accessible areas through the privy chamber and finally to the secret lodgings, the most private and inaccessible area of all. But it's a pattern that he believes was, broadly speaking, true of all his later houses, and the king's bedchamber was always in this innermost area, uh, and usually next to the closet or study, uh, as you can see from this schematic layout. But it's important to remember, of course, that the king's lodgings, including the bedchamber, were exactly that, his, and the queen's, always maintained their own household, which was usually a sort of mirror image of the king's. There was nothing unusual about this, and when the king and queen wished to sleep together, or when the king decided that they would sleep together, uh, it normally involved the king visiting the queen in her own apartments. And there's her room down there, his uh, up there. I hope you won't think it too frivolous, though I'm afraid it is, uh, if I waste a little of my precious time showing you a clip from the 1934 film The Private Life of Henry VIII, as I did once before, where we see Henry processing joylessly to his wedding night tryst with the famously unsatisfactory Anne of Cleves. The royal bedchamber is prepared. 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 Rosewater, 
things I've done for England. Well, there we must leave them to it. Maria Haywood, uh, in her work on the Whitehall Palace inventory of 1542, suggests, th that is the, the cover of the Whitehall uh, inventory transcription and the great inventory of 1547, but um, Maria Haywood suggests that the king's bedchamber measured about 40 by 20 feet, the same size as his dining room, and a similar size to a number of other privy chamber rooms. This was not enormous, but large enough, you would have thought, for a certain amount of furniture and decorations, which you might expect to have been quite grand. And you might also imagine that the inventories, the Great One of 1547 and the Whitehall One, might help us build a picture of what these were and how they were arranged. Sadly, this is not really the case, because the items are mostly listed under categories rather than locations. In fact, apart from the bed itself and the wall hangings, there was very little that we can be sure about. Hayward's reading of the 1542 leads us to conclude that we can be fairly sure about a close stool, about four footstools and two low stools to stand by a bed, probably to help the aging king get in and out of it. The uh, close stool was very luxuriously upholstered with scarlet and crimson silk, but there was no disguising its basic function. The 1547 inventory mentions a few other things. In the king's bedchamber, it tells us, were andirons and fire irons, two cupboards and two tables. Pretty sparse by all appearances. The closet next to the bedchamber was pretty empty too and had some coffers, an inkstand, a few books and a couple of clocks. But the trouble with the 1547 inventory, especially for the privy chamber, is that by the time the clerks were allowed to get access to it uh, and start inventorying what they found, everything had been moved around. And the study next to the king's old bedchamber, by contrast, was so cluttered with precious things and boxes that it looked as if things had been brought from many other rooms and turned it essentially into a storeroom. When we turn to the beds, we're on slightly surer ground, or we think we are. We even have a picture from Henry's beautifully illuminated Psalter. It shows the king seated at his devotions, or reading anyway, in a sumptuous Renaissance interior, which with perhaps colored marble floor tiles and rich columns of faux stone or scagliola, his chair is upholstered to match the bed hangings. The bed itself seems to have been of carved wood with elaborate poor feet and turned posts. And the bed curtains are of a rich blue fabric with Venice gold fringes, or what would have been called fringes of goldsmith work in the inventories. And the valance is embellished with gilded lion's masks, like the one on the chair. It's very splendid, but is it accurate? And the answer to that is probably accurate enough in a general sense, but not in detail. For one thing, the illuminator wasn't English but French and probably never came to England. And for another, he clearly shows the bedchamber on the ground floor, whereas Henry's bedchambers seem always to have been on the first floor. The great inventory lists a number of splendid beds, and it's impossible to tell for sure which were the kings. Generically, they read very similarly, and the main focus was on their sumptuous hangings of embroidered textiles with Venice gold fringes, just like uh, what we see in this image. Several bore the king's arms, and some were decorated with his badges too. One had antique pillars turned of white alabaster and partly gilt, and some were evidently crowned with gilded antique cups. But we know from another document of a bed that must have been particularly magnificent. This was a gift from Francis I, 
at the time of their meeting in Calais in 1532. And it was described as, and I quote, a suite of bed furniture wrought throughout with pearls on crimson velvet, which he, Francis, purchased lately in Paris of an Italian merchant for 10,000 golden crowns. A suite seems to imply more than just a bed and perhaps included a chair and a stool matching the bed like the one in the, in the Psalter image. But it's the reference to being wrought throughout with pearls that sets it apart. Regardless of our uncertainties about the permanent furnishings of the, of the royal bedchamber, we do know a certain amount about other things that passed through. We saw, for example, a couple of bedpans passing through in the movie clip. But they were rather too plain and utilitarian for Tudor taste. Uh, and there were three silver ones in the 1547 inventory, which are described as having long handles plated with silver, having the king's arms enamelled at the end, and weighing more than 100 ounces each. A standard royal protocol was the bringing in and taking away of the so-called knight plate, the plate deemed necessary for the comfort of the king during the night, and which would be solemnly processed in and out, according to a procedure set out in the so-called royal book, which dates from the time of Henry VII, but was revised um, in the 1520s. This stipulated that the usher had to collect the king's cup from the cellar, together with two pots of wine, a basin and water from the ewery, and a pricket candlestick from the groom porter. All of these had to be returned to their various departments first thing in the morning. Now, there are a number of items scattered around the inventory that are specifically called night plate, including a bowl, a ewer with enameled royal arms, a beefy water pot weighing 163 ounces, three Magdalene cups, five cups of assay, several mounted stoneware pots, two silver gilt mounted glasses, and so on. The bedchamber, you'll remember, had two cupboards. So perhaps one of these, something like uh, this maybe, um, was used for setting out the night plate. Well, perhaps more interesting than the uncertain furnishings of the royal bedchamber was some of the other uses to which the room was put. And here, I don't necessarily mean specifically the king's bedchamber, but those of other members of the royal family too. These fall into a number of categories. There were personal matters, like eating. There were matters of state, like receiving New Year's gifts and performing proxy marriages. And there was, in the queen's bedchamber rather than the king's, the hugely serious matter of confinement and childbirth. Let's take eating first. By the end of the reign, uh, it's clear that the king had a separate uh, room for his personal dining. We even have an image of this dining room, a drawing generally accepted as 16th century, even if not by Holbein. If Thurley's analysis is correct, it was uh, right next to the bedroom. But the privy chamber expanded during Henry's reign from a small suite of rooms, a sort of inner sanctum, into something much bigger, like a palace within a palace. And a separate dining room seems to be one of the uh, innovations. From the royal book, it's pretty clear that the bedchamber also doubled as the king's personal eating room. This was the only way to interpret um, a passage that says, sorry, I should say it doubled as his eating room until the, um, the, the, the dining room was, was, um, was created. But there's a passage that says, the gentleman usher ought to forbid no manner of man do set any dish upon the king's bed for fear of hurting the king's rich counterpoints that lie thereupon, and that the said usher take good heed that no man wipe or rub his hands upon none arras, that's fine tapestries, whereby they might be hurted in the chamber where the king is specially and in all other. I must say, the idea of servants needing to be told not to use the precious tapestries as a convenient towel to wipe their greasy fingers on is rather hilarious. 
And the king's rich counterpoints, or counterpanes, were clearly every bit as precious as the tapestries. One of these, and there are many, in the 1547 inventory is described as, and I quote, of green cloth of gold and crimson velvet embroidered with crowns imperial, roses and portcullises. Pretty much a secular version of the wonderful coats formerly in Westminster Abbey and that were given to the Abbey by Henry VII. The receipt of gifts on New Year's Day was one of the red letter days uh, in the court calendar. This was when members of the court presented their annual gift to the king, normally delivered by a servant on their behalf. The value of the gift you gave would depend on your status. Uh, it might take the form of money, or a piece of gold or silver plate, or occasionally something more imaginative. In exchange, you'd receive a gift from the king in the form of some pretty stereotypical piece of plate, a, a cup or a salt maybe, turned out by the London goldsmiths. And of course, you could be sure that the value of what you got would be rather less than what you gave. Uh, if you got nothing, as did sometimes happen, you'd be well advised to put your affairs uh, in order, sooner rather than later. But I raise that because while it's clear that later in the reign this ceremony was held in a relatively accessible area, such as the King's Gallery, um, earlier custom had placed it actually in the royal bedchamber. The royal book couldn't be more clear on this, and it's worth quoting or paraphrasing and looking, meanwhile, at another um, royal bedchamber scene uh, from Henry VIII's tapestries of the uh, King of David at Ecouen where the king is, is kneeling before his bed um, at his devotions and with a couple of um, uh, servants or courtiers uh, visiting him. On New Year's Day in the morning, as the king is rising, an usher of the chamber is to be ready at the chamber door and will say, Sire, here is a New Year's gift coming from the queen. And the king shall say, let it come in, sire. Then the usher shall let in the messenger with the gift. And after the servants of the great nobleman shall come, each one in order of precedence. And after that has been done, all other lords and ladies in order. And all this while, the king must sit by the bed. One of the um, strangest accounts of all that I came across during my trawl through the state papers of the reign of Henry VIII was the account of the proxy wedding of Henry's younger sister, Mary, with uh, Louis XII of France. Mary, by all accounts, uh, was a beautiful young woman of 18, um, and uh, Louis the, um, was a rather less beautiful, gouty, and seriously aging monarch of 52. This was not a marriage made in heaven. As Charles Lawton would have said, it was one of those things she did for England. Mary travelled to France with a huge retinue in October 1514 to meet her husband, who got so excited about the whole thing that he promptly dropped dead about three months later. There's a nice story that he showed the English ambassador a box of jewels that he planned to give his wife. But my wife shall not have all at once, but at diverse times for he would have many, and at diverse times, kisses and thanks for them. But that's another story too. The point of mentioning it now is that for reasons of state, it was deemed necessary for the happy couple to be officially married already. And this is what happened at Greenwich in August of that year, uh, almost certainly in a royal bedchamber. The first part of the ceremony was courtly and refined. The Princess Mary and the Duke de Longueville appeared. Various solemn speeches were delivered, after which they took each other by the right hand, recited the words of the contract in French, and signed it. After that, the Duke gave the Princess a gold ring, which she placed on his fourth finger of her right hand. Um, all that, you might think, is fair enough. But what followed is quite strange, bizarre even. And I quote, the bride undressed and went to bed in the presence of many witnesses. 
These seem to have included no less than the King, the Queen, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Dukes of Buckingham, Norfolk and Suffolk, and the Bishops of Winchester and Durham, to name but some. Enter then the Marquis de Rotelin in his doublet with a pair of red hose, but with one leg naked from the middle of the thigh downwards. Went into bed and touched the Queen of the Princess with his naked leg. And on that magical note, the marriage was declared consummated uh, and there was great rejoicing all round. <laughs> the marriage of Mary and Louis, as it happens, was not blessed with children. But of course, having children was the whole point of dynastic marriages. And when that time came, immense precautions were taken to minimize the risks. Probably the best source of these uh, protocols is a document called the Northumberland Ceremonial which sets out rules for certain formal events in the Earl's household, including the ordering of a lady in the estate of a countess when she shall take her chamber. They are, immense, they are immensely detailed, these uh, instructions. They go on for pages and pages, and they're almost certainly a mirror of how such events were conducted in the royal household. As the time of her confinement approached, the lady would attend chapel, and make her offering. Endless carpets and cushions and supporting arms were deployed to protect her lest, um, lest uh, she uh, fall and hurt the baby. That done, she's accompanied in procession back to her quarters where a ceremonial void is taken. The void was normally the concluding ceremony of a banquet. It involved sweet wine and spice, or as we might say, I suppose, petit four. The spice and the wine were served in a carefully choreographed ritual involving elaborate footed dishes and covered cups and the Eucharistic tones of the entire ceremony are frankly impossible to miss. And here it is again, though slightly toned down from the tapestry. It's a sort of courtly ritual of hope and it was the last moment that involved both men and women. After the lady had taken spice and the spice plate recovered, after the cup bearer, had, cup bearer had come before the lady with such wine as she list to drink, and ceremonial bowing and scraping and ritual towel, towel wiping had been done, the lady and her attendants retired to her bedchamber. And the directions for the furnishing of the room during confinement are fascinating. Life carries on as normal, but in a bubble. It's an all-female cast, with women taking on the roles normally assigned to men. For example, gentlewomen ushers shall be in the room, that is to say the role uh, of gentlemen. Gentlewomen shall be appointed to bear dishes to the lady of the room, uh, in, in the room of the yeoman of the chamber, uh, and so on. During this time, the bedchamber is effectively sealed off from the rest of the household and becomes a self-contained mini-court. Sealed off, indeed, in more ways than one. Quote, the bedchamber where the lady shall lie to be hanging with arras, or with other such stuff as shall be thought most necessary and convenient for it. Round about the sides and the end of it. Except the windows, which are to be hanging with traverses or curtains, to draw before the said windows. Also the roof, that's the ceiling, um, of the said chamber shall be sealed over, close with such stuff as shall be convenient for it, and like the stuff that can, uh, as like as can be, the stuff that the said chamber is hanging with. To complete the uh, picture of extreme coziness, uh, a further traverse to be quote, hanging over the door of the chamber for keeping of the said chamber secret and close for seeing in at the door when it is opened. Lest, despite all these provisions, any hint of draught were to enter the room, the bed of a state itself provided a further line of defense with curtains of such stuff as shall be convenient for it and as like the stuff that the said chamber is hanging with as can be. And in this stifling, airless, tapestry-lined box, the mother-to-be and her ladies sit out her labor. But the lady was not to be deprived of any of her needs, bodily or spiritual. 
Meals were to be properly served. Indeed, to judge from the offices listed, ushers, carvers, servers, cupbearers, and so forth, they were to be served with all the dignity associated with normal royal dining. And dignity was further maintained by the plate deployed. A cupboard or buffet with five shelves was to be set up in the chamber. It was to have, quote, a carpet upon it and to be covered with a carpet cloth of diaper or linen and a candlestick upon it. The silver to be placed on it was carefully prescribed. Pots on the first stage, flagons on the second, then bowls, then cups, and finally goblets with such other plate as shall be thought requisite and necessary. The text doesn't tell us how many of these vessels were to be put out, but presumably, given her status, not many fewer than we see on the screen here. Not a bad backdrop, you might say, for one of life's more dangerous rites of passage. A gentlewoman was appointed to be yeoman of the cellar, with responsibility for all the plate that was used. Nor was that all. Silver candlesticks were placed around the room, and a plate of silver, it's a sconce, was ordained to be hanging in the said chamber for getting light to the said bed when the windows be closed. But there was still more. One of the most striking things about these arrangements was their spiritual dimension. In addition to the secular and bodily provisions, the chamber was to be equipped with an altar, placed so that it may, be, may stand best for the lady to see the service of mass at the altar where she lieth. And the altar was to be magnificently equipped. A chalice, pattern, and picks were to be placed on it, and on a stage or shelf behind it were placed, wait for it, a cross between six images, a pair of basins, a holy water bucket, a pax, a pair of candlesticks, and a pair of cruets. This was extraordinary, perhaps looking something uh, like this. But the text mentions one other curious addition to an already crowded altar, a girdle with a mass book. Uh, it's not entirely clear what this girdle was all about, but it may have had a rather special role to play uh, as a protection, a kind of spiritual protection against mishap. Relics were a vital part of traditional religion and were most effective when actually touched. And when it came to royal childbirth, the greatest must-have in England was um, the Virgin Mary's girdle, which was one of the treasures uh, of Westminster Abbey. Uh, this isn't it, by the way. But there were a number of other such girdles with alleged saintly associations in monasteries up and down the country. And these were sometimes lent out to expectant mothers to ease their labour pains. Perhaps the Countess of Northumberland would have had access to one of these, and very likely they played a part in royal birth too, certainly until the Reformation. There is, of course, one function of the bedchamber that we haven't mentioned, and that is the place of dying. Not exactly by way of conclusion, for there are no real conclusions to be drawn from this random sampling of royal bedchamber anecdotes, but by way of winding up, Privacy was not a readily available commodity in Tudor England, even in royal Tudor England. But the bedchamber was the place where it was most likely to be found, if only in the sense that you could control, normally, who had access to it. And there were occasions when that mattered a lot. It mattered, for example, to Catherine Howard when she was entertaining her admirers. But it also mattered if you were the Duke of Somerset, if you just witnessed the death of the king and wanted to make sure all the necessary arrangements were in place before the news leaked out. And this is exactly what happened. Everyone knew, of course, that the old king was ailing, and this propagandist portrait shows him looking far too animated as he dictates his will. After rallying once or twice, he finally died on the 28th of January, 1547. But it was essential to hush it up as long as possible, and Somerset saw to it that as far as the outside world was concerned, the king was still alive, with meals continuing to be borne in with the usual ceremony uh, and to the sound of trumpets. Only when Somerset's plans had been fully worked out and his own future assured was the chamber door opened and the truth allowed out. One can only hope that no dishes were set upon the king's bed 
for fear of hurting the rich counterparts. Thank you.